Hello, Miwi. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> um, can you tell me where this collection got started? Some of these stories were more recent creations um, that I worked on in the last couple of years, two or three years. And some started, I think at least the germ of the, some of these stories started during my MFA in the mid 2000s, uh, a long time ago, about 10 years ago, I think. And they've taken on different shapes and forms since then. But also once, um, once I signed on with Kaya Press and started working with the editor there, then the collection changed again. And so yeah. my editor, Sun Young Lee, who's fantastic, she had ideas about ordering, about what themes could be pulled out and emphasized a bit more. And, and she even asked to see other pieces that I'd written or even if they were half finished. And it wasn't so much that she <clears throat> wanted to include those pieces, but she wanted to uh, understand more of what made me tick or what makes these stories tick, what kind of other things they have in common that might not have been so obvious in the way that I presented them. So that was really revelatory in a way. I feel like I learned a lot more about what my uh, impulses and yeah. obsessions are as a writer. Can you tell yeah. me about some of those impulses and obsessions? Oh, I, sh I should be, I should be, maybe I should be lying down on the couch telling you those. <laughs> well, there are some obvious ones like um, how diaspora affects your sense of self and, um, <clears throat> and your connection or disconnection to culture. Mm -hmm. Also themes on loss and um, endurance. Yeah. I think that uh, a lot of the characters in the collection, they, they have been displaced either <clears throat> physically from their countries of origin or internally sort of spiritually displaced in a way that, where their relationships to the people that are supposed to be closest to them are actually fractured or those tectonic plates have shifted in a way and they're trying to sort of get back that sense of connection and cohesion mm -hmm. and sometimes it's <clears throat> sometimes it's as um it's a simpler thing as um how hard it is to communicate and connect with someone yeah. and you keep missing each other even when you're sitting in the same room but somehow those connections get made and i would even venture as far to say the connections get made across time and place as well so the stories aren't, aren't um, explicitly linked but there are things that happen in one story that reverberate or echo mm -hmm. or that seems to be a sort of version of um, the life of another character in another story yeah. so yeah. yeah do you remember the very first story that you wrote in this collection can you, um, <clears throat> can you describe it and then describe how it is or isn't different from the very last story that, that made it to this collection? Yeah, it's such a... We were talking before about how writing is such a weird, mysterious process and yeah. sometimes you get like ghosts of... Yeah. Fragments or ghosts of other things that you've written kind of finding their way into yeah. the writing. And so um, the, some of these stories have existed or the, in different car incarnations in the past and I suppose last of her name the title story started life as a completely different story maybe 20 years ago it started as a story about these two sisters painting the house their family's house every summer there's no painting left in the story <laughs> at all um and i realized that because i wasn't really sure what kind of story it was i thought it was a story about rituals and child labor yeah. <laughs> um but um or but then i realized <laughs> then i realized that um actually this family that's depicted in last of her name that's pretty much the family that was in that first incarnation of the story but what i wanted to write about was actually i discovered later as i kept returning to it over the years it turned out to be something completely different mm -hmm. so what was that different 
Well, you have to read the story to find out. Oh, no, you've read the story. Yes. But the way that the story is now, it's set in three time periods. We switch between the daughter, Karen, her point of view in 1980s England. She's 12 years old and obsessed with martial arts mm -hmm. period TV shows. And uh, so that's 1980s England with Karen and then her mom, uh, just a few years when she was a few years older in Hong Kong, just on the eve of World War II, at least on the eve of the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, and, um, and her practicing Kung Fu in the village and um, surrounded by oppressive patriarchy. And then we have Karen's mother again, but in the 1970s in England when she's just emigrated to the UK. So we have these three time periods, three settings, and three different perspectives um, so there wasn't that kind of complexity or switching around perspectives mm. or that kind of juxtapositioning of points of view in the original story which was very simple it was house painting lemonade mm -hmm. neighbors it was almost like a little slice of life sort of vignette like almost mm -hmm. originally and then it became this epic story yeah. Can you maybe <laughs> say what you feel like um, was a, accomplished or, you know, like maybe what kind of themes you were able to then get at with like the addition of all these other perspectives? In that story, it talks about very culturally specific nerdiness, geek aspects of that particular kind of Chinese, British popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, even though it's really specific in that way, I think what's universal is the fact that all of our parents have secret lives that we don't know a lot about and that's something that I was able to explore by having Karen's mum's perspective. There are some things that Karen will never know but she probably imagine or gets hints of and, um, and there are some things, many things about her daughter that June will never really really know and I think that's sort of part of what makes me really sad but also I think it's just a necessary part of life yeah. as well you know now you really don't always know intimately the people that you're most intimate with mm -hmm. <laughs> can you tell me about why you chose that title last of her name as the title of your book yeah um I like how it sounds really epic and dramatic yeah. and yeah. uh but also how it conjures up associations with inheritance as well. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of Chinese culture and a lot of Western cultures as well, material inheritance only happens through the male line. Uh, the women don't get squat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, even the, the idea of um, the, the surname being passed down through the, through the male. So I was interested in, in the idea of inheritance referring, in this context, referring to what what girls and women born into yes. and what they inherit that isn't necessarily obvious. So it could be trauma, it could be resilience, it could be certain talents or skills or certain qualities of relatives, ancestors, yeah. or that um, all of those things, but on a, more of a, on a larger cultural scale mm -hmm. as well.